Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Um, we'll get started in just a moment here. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar has been convened by the Critical Zone or CZN Early Career Network in partnership with the Critical Zone um, Collaborative Network. This is the first in a series of um, series that the CZN Early Career Network has planned with the goal of enhancing collaboration and synthesis across CZ observatory and watershed sites. Um, welcome to the first week of this quasi fall cyber seminar series introduction to the critical zone observatories and watershed sites this six part series will continue each week um, at the same time until september 28th my name is julia masterman i'm the education and outreach specialist for quasi um, quasi is the consortium of universities for the advancement of hydrologic science our mission is to advance water science by strengthening collaboration providing critical infrastructure through our data services and promoting education in water science at all levels, in part through programs like the Cyber Seminar Series. Quasi also serves as the national coordinating hub for the Critical Zone Collaborative Network, or CZCN. Um, we're thankful to, the, to members of the CZ Network team um, for all of their contributions to this series. I'd encourage you to reach out to me, visit our website, or sign up for our newsletter or join the community Slack channel uh, to learn more about Quasi or to get involved. I'll add information on all those things in the chat. Uh, as we get started here, a few logistical things. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel later this afternoon. Um, secondly, we ask that you use the Q&A functionality to submit questions to our panelists. And finally, we expect that all involved with quasi cyber seminars promote and maintain a professional, considerate, respectful, and collaborative virtual environment. Um, we have a number of speakers lined up um, today, and um, the presentations will go back to back. So when you do submit questions, please do so throughout the hour um, and try to note uh, if your question is directed at a specific presentation or speaker, please note who that is um, when you submit the question um, so that uh, our panelists or our speakers today can answer um, those questions. Thank you again for joining us and to the CZN uh, Early Career Network for putting together this fantastic lineup of presentations. Thank you to our presenters for taking the time to join us today. And with that, I will pass the mic to the CZN Early Career Network steering committee member and research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, Dr. Aurora. Thank you, Julia. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. Thanks. So welcome everyone. Um, as Julia said, I'm Bhavna Aurora. I'm a research scientist at Berkeley Lab. And I'm thrilled to be, um, you know, starting this or launching this fall 2021 quasi cyber seminar series that's focused on an overview of the critical zone observatories and their watershed equivalents. Now the series is being convened by an early career cohort group in partnership with the critical zone collaborative network. So you might be wondering what the early career um, cohort team is. As you can see from the list of conveners, we are members uh, from different institutes, from different disciplines and even different countries. So, um, the Early Career group, Cohort Group came together two years ago uh, with the purpose of advancing modes of collaboration across the critical zone networks, providing a foundation to do together what would be impossible to do alone. So we do have this existing uh, infrastructure across the CZ network sites and watershed sites. And um, what we are aiming for uh, with the enhanced collaboration is to work towards transferable and broadly applicable questions, tools, and approaches. 
So in the same vein, this particular cyber seminar series is designed to facilitate cross-site and cross-network knowledge. And the ultimate goal here is to help guide the directions and content of an upcoming AGU workshop. The AGU workshop is titled Towards an International Critical Zone Network of Networks for the Next Generation Through Shared Science, Tools, Data, and Philosophy. So our aim there is to engage and enhance an international early career network and to identify a subset of prioritized grand challenge questions to work together on synthesis and integration activities across these sites. Uh, we also wanna use the workshop as a platform to help facilitate coordinated and transdisciplinary investigations of the critical zone. So just to say the timeline here, this first week of the quasi fall cyber seminar series is focused on critical zone sites uh, across montane and pristine environments and thinking about where the synergies exist between them and where we could um, initiate some of those uh, synthesis activities. We also have another series planned uh, later this fall that's going to be focused on tools for integrating and synthesizing data from across these CZ sites um, and, and their watershed equivalents. Again, uh, we have the uh, 2021 December workshop within AGU. Uh, so that's coming up on September 1st, or you could RSVP us. Uh, I'll share that link in the chat pretty soon. I do wanna say uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the guidance of our senior advisors um, and my early career cohort team. And with that, I wanna pass this on to Pam to introduce our speakers uh, for today. Yeah, so right before I introduce the speakers, we sent out an email to ask them about what are some conceptual models that could be tested across their site and other sites. And these were just some of the responses. And so when starting to think about some of the um, different ways that we might be able to do synthesis, this may be some foundational ways we can think about it. So I'm not going to read through each one of these, but I'll just touch on some of the ideas. So thinking about the differences in the controls of bedrock composition and how that might relate to things like ecosystem dynamics and rigorous thickness, or thinking about how stress states, either topographic or tectonic, may influence how that landscape evolves and is formed over time. Understanding the kind of overall rates at which a catchment drains, and then what does that mean for its sensitivity to change over time? What it might mean if we if we're able to look at above ground forest carbon and think about how we relate that to subsurface properties. What does that mean? And then thinking about kind of the plant microbial mineral interactions and their influence on hill slope elements and water export with one of the goals um, across many of the critical zone sites. Uh, being trying to really understand what drives concentration discharge and what kind of factors may lead to their disturbance. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Susan Hubbard. She is the Associate Lab Director at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, hi, Pam, you can hear me? <clears throat> and see my screen, yes? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Well, um, Thanks to the conveners for, um, for, for organizing this. I'm super excited to see um, presentations in this whole series. Uh, I lead the Watershed Function Project, a, a, a very nice and large Department of Energy um, a watershed project, and it's located at the East River Community Watershed. Um, I'll say a little bit about both the project and the site, and I'd like to acknowledge um, my team members, including Bhavna. <laughs> Um, we're located in the Upper Colorado River Basin. The Upper Colorado is really the water tower of the West, provides water for one in every 10 Americans. It provides a lot of water for agriculture and hydroelectric power. Um, it supports about a trillion dollars of economic activity per year uh, across these <clears throat> various states that it runs through. And the East River itself is a very representative um, mountainous watershed. It's about 300 square kilometers. Um, and it has extreme gradients in terms of uh, not just elevation, but of course, vegetation and weather, um, biogeochemistry, <clears throat> hydrology, uh, and even bedrock. It's underlain by Manco Shale, but other bedrock, um, other bedrock as well. 
I'll say a little bit more about the site, but for reference here, I want to mention that it's been um, described in several recent reports, including this DOE report on open watershed science by design, which also mentions the other large Department of Energy watersheds that are uh, spread around the nation. This was an integrated hydro terrestrial modeling workshop um, that included Department of Energy, but scientists funded by many other US federal agencies. And it talked about this site as being a great uh, use case site for water in the West challenges. And then this recent National Academy report, Earth in Time, um, identified the East River as really a field-based user facility that supports um, many folks throughout the community. And that's why I'm really happy to tell you a little bit about it and welcome you um, to take advantage of the infrastructure of this site. So uh, this project is really focused on developing a predictive understanding of how mountainous watersheds retain and release water, nutrients, carbon, and metals in response to disturbance and over sub-seasonal to decadal timescales. So as this figure on the left is trying to illustrate, we're working from bedrock to canopy across terrestrial and aquatic um, interfaces along these gradients and across scales, really from genome uh, to the aggregated watershed. Um, we are really agnostic about the type of disturbance we are looking at. It could be droughts and floods and wildfires. Right now, though, we are trying to get a um, predictive understanding about how snow dynamics um, influence how different parts of this system contribute to exports with an early focus on water and nitrogen cycle, and then how this system aggregates that into this very simple concentration discharge signature um, that, the, uh, that the system gives us. We are um, uh, fortunate that this test site has really provided us a, a nice variability in snow dynamics over the last few years, shown here, some years being high and, and early, some years being low snow and late. So it's a great data sets to work with. And how do we go about um, addressing our grand challenge? <clears throat> well, a large part of our team really works um, at the detailed process level scale on hill slopes and the river corridor, um, collecting a lot of measurements, um, doing fine scale reactive transport and hydrological modeling, um, and testing hypothesis. And this is what we call in the DOE vernacular MODEX, so model data experiment integration at the fine scale, trying to understand underlying processes. This is very well instrumented now with some intensive sites and satellite sites. We have about 100 million data points, 600 uh, uh, different types of sensors out there. And then part of our team focuses on aggregating all of this understanding that's developed across different life zones and compartments. Um, and this is done by a couple different approaches. One, developing new modeling strategies. One of these is called scale aware, where we're trying to be able to develop capabilities of models to zoom in and zoom out in terms of resolution. Um, but we're also developing ways to aggregate in terms of our characterization approach. So trying to figure out what is minimum but sufficient to characterize to really capture the behavior of the site. And one of the um, constructs that we're testing in these first few years on this project is what we're calling watershed functional zones. And the idea here is um, to use a, a range of, uh, well, really extreme data layers in the watershed. We have remote sensing data layers that capture the bedrock variability, um, the, of course, topography, the vegetation, the snow, together with point measurements and machine learning to try and identify these, what we call functional zones or regions in the landscape that have a unique distribution of bedrock through canopy properties that are different from neighboring regions. So you can imagine an alpine uh, uh, functional zone might have quite a, a different response to a disturbance than a lower lying riparian zone. The idea here is to be able to capture all of that complexity um, in a way that's much more tractable and accurate to guide further field characterization and as well as to be ported into models. So one of the questions I'd love to um, have other sites consider, we've recently, we have a paper that's in review by Haruka Wainwright that shows that this functional zone um, approach is reasonable for characterization that also describes uh, distinct behaviors within these zones relevant to the water and nitrogen cycle. Is this a useful model for working and characterizing across life zone compartments and interfaces at other sites? We have a lot of questions on this project. I don't have time to go through them too much, but let me mention that we have um, questions and a large part of our team working on understanding how water partitions along these steep mountainous gradients and particularly how can we reduce uncertainty in some of the most uncertain aspects such as ET. I'm gonna show you some recent um, work coming out of our team. I don't have time to go into it, but it's there for further reference. 
Um, we have a part of our team led by Jill Banfield's group focused on understanding how the watershed microbiome varies with vegetation, with geomorphology and other watershed characteristics. Um, we have a significant part of our team focused on understanding what plant microbe mineral actions uh, interactions occur and how do they affect those hill slope elements and water exports. Um, so for example, right now our, our nitrogen and watershed exports were focused on that question and looking at the shallow part of the section. So really trying to understand interactions between my, microbes and plants and soils and how those change as, as snow is delivered and, and snow melts and thaws and infiltrates. And then we have another part where we're looking deeper in the section at our bedrock and particularly interactions between the weathered zone bedrock here and an oscillating water table. We have a recent paper in Nature Geoscience. So I want to wrap up in saying that gaining a predictive understanding of mountainous watershed hydrobiogeochemistry and its response to disturbance, disturbances is, as we know, very challenging, um, but super excited about the opportunity for extreme collaborations and use of these open science principles to advance collectively new constructs and also to take advantage of enabling technologies and and we tried to describe in a paper recently the real potential of exascale and AI and 5G and so forth for trying to um, develop and address these common, um, common challenges across the sites. So thanks uh, for your attention. I'd like to thank our watershed team um, shown here. We have many collaborators. Um, we've supported about 500 different investigators at the site. So if you are interested in bringing your you know, questions and tools and hypotheses to the site and taking advantage of the infrastructure, please, um, visit our website, contact me or any of our team members, and thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. So next we're going to introduce Holly Barnard. She's an associate professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Holly, please, uh, un yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Great. Thanks, Pam. All good? Okay. Um, well, thanks for the invitation for us for the opportunity to share um, uh, information about our new critical zone cluster focused on dynamic water storage. So this is um, a team I'm super proud to be working with. So we have nine different PIs from six different institutions and three uh, senior personnel from uh, federal agencies who are partnering with us to provide guidance and insight. So our team is growing. We're just in our, our first year and uh, we're finishing up our first year. But so one of the first questions our team had to tackle was we, we knew we were all interested in the role of storage in terms of how it controlled CZ processes. But one of the issues was how do we all define um, storage? So in this case, we're defining storage in terms of water's ability to do work. And we're thinking of dynamic storage as being that sort of Goldilocks zone where on one end of the spectrum, we can have very uh, rapid, fast moving water that doesn't remain in the system long enough to really do a lot of work. I mean, it can cause some flushing and things and process, important processes, but it doesn't reside in the subsurface long enough to really um, drive those processes. At the other end of the spectrum, we have um, you know, long-term groundwater, which has the potential to come into equilibrium with the system. And what we're really interested in is that water that's in between those two end members. So uh, there it won't be an opportunity to talk about every one of our catchments in particular, but the framework that we used is that we chose five different catchments that are similar in latitude, so similar in energy inputs but they vary in geology. And as a result, they also vary in their dynamic storage. So uh, again, thinking about our ends of the spectrum, we have Gordon Gulch, a montane catchment just located outside of the city of Boulder. Um, it is a granitic catchment with very shallow regolith and very low storage. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the Sage Hen um, experimental catchment located um, outside of Tahoe. So there we have a combination of volcanic and granitic um, geologies with, as a result, we have very deep regolith and deep um, storage. And our remaining sites sort of fill in everything in between. So the goals of our project are to understand how this variability in storage drives different critical zone processes. So we're taking a very integrative approach 
Um, so we are interested in both how storage dr drives above ground processes such as variability in ET, and then also deep weathering processes. Um, so in addition, we're interested in how these processes will change with disturbance. And I, I should have mentioned when I uh, talked about our five watersheds, the Cold Creek catchment is actually a tributary to the East River um, that Susan just talked about. And you can see that we have a lot of overlap and in interest as well. So there's already some ability um, to build collaborations there. And last, one of the things that I'll try to talk about is um, we have a real dedication to training the next generation of earth scientists. So our questions are really uh, focused on understanding how the subsurface can mediate or exacerbate um, critical zone processes. And so our field instrument, our field instrumentation is focused again, looking at both above ground and below ground processes. So focused on everything from looking at isotopes and remote sensing to scale up all the way down to leaf scale water potential measurements, and then also understanding more of the weathering aspects um, as well in terms of looking at our rooting depths, soil gas production um, and solute production. From our field measurements, we wanna take a scaffolding approach to our modeling. So building up from our plot scale where we can begin to understand variability in basic processes such as infiltration and preferential flow, building up to the hill slope scale and wh where we can look at lateral redistribution of storage, and then all the way up to more complex catchment scale models of reactive transport and eco um, hydrological processes. Once we have scaffolded these processes and to the extent possible coupled them, then we hope to be able to um, do virtual experiments in terms of looking at disturbance and its role on the landscape. And last, um, I know this is focused on introdu introducing the catchments, but um, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the things that um, our group is particularly passionate about is training and providing opportunities for the next generation of earth scientists. So I'd also just like to make a plug for folks who are interested in collaborating on those types of efforts. We have a, a multi-pronged approach where we are a you know, doing work for public outreach. Um, Naomi Tag is leading um, two of our initiatives, one looking at Future Mountain, which is creating a, a virtual game where the public can interact with the landscape, uh, see how fire and other disturbances um, uh, you know, cause changes in water availability on the landscape. Um, at the K through 12 level, we're working with a, a nonprofit called Earth Explorers to provide training and exposure to middle school students. And then um, also REU, uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates, and also um, partnering with the Professional Master's Program at UCSB. So, um, I'm super excited to hear about the other catchments and I would like to encourage all participants to reach out if um, you'd like to chat and discuss potential for collaboration. With that, I am finished. Ollie, thanks so much, that was terrific. Next up, we have Stephen Holbrook, a professor at Virginia Tech. Take it away, Steve. Thanks, Pam, and I want to thank um, all of the uh, the conveners. I'm really excited to be presenting here, and I'm especially excited to be presenting to a group of uh, early career folks. Oh, I guess this is on some kind of a uh, auto advance. That'll be interesting. Um, so I'm going to tell you about our project, which we refer to as the Bedrock Critical Zone Network (BCZN). You can see the um, institutions involved. Um, we're funded through NSF's CZCN program, and we're very grateful for that funding. Um, it's um, a, a lot of people, eight different universities, um, a lot of folks involved. Um, I'm not going to read out all these names in the interest of time. Suffice it to say, it's a great team. I often begin my emails to the team, um, dear dream team. Um, what our motivation is, um, is that the the structure and function of the critical zone, its architecture is poorly understood, especially at landscape scales. And we come at this with a couple of um, motivations, could even say biases, I suppose. One is that geology matters. 
especially bedrock geology, its composition, its initial state. Another is that, especially in montane systems like we're discussing today, uh, what happens if depth doesn't stay at depth? These are eroding systems and whatever comes into the conveyor at the bottom is eventually gonna have an effect at the surface. And these effects can be, these feedbacks can be bi-directional from uh, bottom of the critical zone up and vice versa. We wanna improve our understanding of that. Um, the questions that we are addressing, and there are a lot of sub questions here, but fundamentally we'd like to better understand what controls the thickness and structure of regolith across landscapes. We'd like to know how and why subsurface weathering and porosity vary spatially across landscapes. Um, we'd like to know how those subsurface properties affect landscape evolution, erosion, hydrologic processes, and ecosystems. And we'd like to better understand these bi-directional couplings between um, the surface part of the critical zone and the, and the deep critical zone. Um, and how those things uh, emerge as controls on critical zone structure. One of the things that, um, that the conveners asked us to think about before these presentations was what conceptual models are emerging from our work or, um, or have driven our work. And that, that was an interesting question. I've listed three here. One is um, we, we hypothesize that bedrock composition exerts a fundamental control on regolith thickness and ecosystem dynamics. And we think there's a lot of evidence for that already. Our project is designed to, um, to test those ideas. Another, which comes out of this um, St. Clair et al. Um, paper that came out a few years back in, in science is that the state of stress influences the landscape scale pattern of fracture opening. And that at some sites, but crucially not at all sites, that's the dominant control on critical zone thickness um, where the fractures can start to open. And, and finally, something that's kind of emerging from our initial results, which I'll talk about in a second, is that it's becoming clear that vegetation plays an important, possibly even in some places, a dominant role in transforming bedrock into regolith. Um, we're, we're, we're throwing a lot of different methods at this. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but we're, we're focused uh, a lot on geophysics, geochemistry, geomorphology, modeling both before before and after the field work. And I wanna, I've highlighted a couple things here that I think are relatively unique in our project. And one is a fundamental goal of our project is to provide the community with access to the deeper parts of the critical zone. So we're, we're doing a lot of drilling, geoprobe sampling and coring, collecting of cuttings, downhole logging, that sort of thing at our sites. And another is what we're calling the virtual critical zone, which is um, making measurements of physical and chemical properties at um, in great detail a lot at road cuts, trenches, and, and quarries, and building those into um, virtual models, which we think will lead to both new discoveries and to great outreach and educational opportunities. We're working at eight sites across um, the US. Importantly, they're all crystalline bedrock. We chose crystalline bedrock because its initial porosity is near zero, so that any porosity that we measure in the subsurface must be the product of weathering, both physical and chemical. These sites um, were selected to span a range of controlling parameters, which are shown here. I'm not going to go into detail here, but our sites, which are, which are denoted here with the, with the letters, span different ranges of climate, which, which we hypothesize might control chemical depletion, um, different um, shapes of, uh, we predicted different shapes of regoliths because they span different topographic patterns and different states of stress and they span um, different states of bedrock in terms of its composition and initial fracture density, which we um, hypothesize might control porosity. Um, our, our template for doing this acquisition, and we've just had our first field season this past summer at two sites, which I'll tell you a little bit about briefly, but our template is to do modeling of the state of stress first, to design our geophysical transects on the basis of that, then to collect the geophysics, and then to, to drill and do geoprobe sampling um, with some deep drill holes and then surrounded by um, dense uh, arrays of geoprobe uh, cores across the landscape. So I'll give you just two quick um, uh, results from our, because just because I'm excited about it and it's fun from our field work this past summer, uh, one from South Carolina, uh, a line that goes here, you can see the stress model. This is the predicted depth at which we think the fractures might begin to open up. And that's what's shown over here. This model preceded the geophysical field work by several months. And when we look at what the velocity, the seismic velocity pattern looks like there, 
it's um, I think it's a pretty stunning it's a pretty stunning match. Um, it's not perfect. There's some other things going on in places, but this site appears to be a place where the state of stress is really controlling um, the patterns of regolith across the landscape. That doesn't work everywhere. We we know that. And one place where it doesn't work is Panola. Um, any place where there's large bedrock outcrops, the state of stress is not controlling it. That's there for another reason. I'll show you a quick transect that goes across here. It crosses two different kinds of geology. The outcrop is very fast. It's solid granite at the surface. Um, forest over here has about 15, 10, 15 meters of regolith. And then over here, and here this, this profile shows the strong control of lithology on bedrock patterns. The, the, over here, this bi-type nice 30, 40 meters of regolith compared to the granite. A really interesting thing is this oasis here that goes across the middle of this. And we did some detailed work in there. This is a composite of seismic velocity and color, GPR reflectivity, and um, structure for motion, vegetation, all to scale, no vertical exaggeration. And what this is showing us is these trees and these small little um, oases are creating regolith that goes down 10 or 12 meters, um, far deeper than we think that the roots go. And that's really pretty exciting. So I think that this is pointing to a strong role for vegetation. Lots of opportunities for collaboration here. Um, access to drill core cutting samples. We have lots of ongoing um, collaborations with other groups, um, including Holly's team. And so if any of you are interested in, um, in learning more about the opportunities, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thanks. Steve, thanks so much. All right, um, we have two more to go. So next up, uh, Antonello Provencal, if you can uh, share your screen. He is yep. uh, the director of um, the Institute of Geosciences from the National Research Council of Italy. Antonello, take it away. Yep, I will try to share my screen with this. Um, okay. So I, I think I've, okay. Just give me one second. This is. Okay, try again. No, I think we, let's use the backup. Let's not. Bhavna, can you? Uh, spend too much time. Yeah, right. I think it's. Uh, I had to enter through the not through the web browser, but through the thing, through the, okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. So if you can put, uh, that's, that's perfect. So the, um, we are from the National Research Council of Italy and the University of Torino, and also from the University of Pisa, and then we work on uh, about three lines. At least I'm going to talk about what is happening to, to critical zones about three lines. So like, next, next slide. Uh, we have two, well, we, we are studying various things, but the two questions we have now are what are the drivers of carbon fluxes and water fluxes in high altitude and high latitude ecosystems? And then what kind of models, whether process-based or empirical or what, can we develop for, for, uh, for describing this, the dependence on the drivers in order to do climate projections and future projections and how general they can be. So next slide. Um, so in, in, if we look at the pillars of the critical zone today, I will tell you what we are doing on the gas fluxes. So next slide. Two places. We are uh, considering two places mainly here. One is at the Gran Paradiso, northwestern Italy in uh, the Alps, altitude between 1,500 meters more or less and 4,000, more than 4,000 meters. Our plot is uh, are at uh, 2,600 meters about. And the second is uh, at Spitsbergen in the catchment of the Bayelva River. And uh, interestingly enough, the two tundra are quite similar. I mean, many vegetation species are the same in the two, in the two places. Next slide. So at uh, Nivole, which is the place in uh, this, this high plain uh, uh, between uh, 2,700 meters and 2,500 meters, uh, which is the highest in Europe, we have uh, five plots. One is on carbonates, the, the A plot, what is with the A. One is on gneiss, which is the dominant rock. And the two are on glacial mix. And then there is a fifth one on alluvial, uh, on the alluvial plain uh, nearby the, the lake, 
one of the questions was to investigate the differences in the bedrock and if, if they have corresponding differences in the soil properties and in the fluxes. Next slide. So we started sampling in 2017 and then we are still ongoing with uh, we have in each plot we have uh, 20 measurements of ecosystem respiration with portable flux chamber and uh, with a system of portable flux chambers and 20 measurements uh, of the uh, net, net ecosystem exchange and from the difference we can get the gross primary production. We also do soil and vegetation samples. Uh, next, next slide. In parallel to the flux chambers, we have uh, uh, a system of eddy covariance towers, one year, one in, uh, in uh, Bayelva, and another one is coming. And then we have also in installed, installed uh, fixed flux chambers for, for measuring the carbon and water fluxes. Uh, next slide. Bayelva, we are using this uh, climate change tower that is uh, in the, near the village of Neolisund. And we have an eddy covariance at an eight height of about seven meters now, a little less, between six and seven. And then the, again, the, the portable flux chambers, the, the fluxes are very low here. And also sampling of water, water isotopes and, and uh, stable isotopes uh, uh, and, and the story of the water uh, from, from the uh, melting of the glaciers to the, to the fjord. Next slide. So here comes the, the, the part that uh, we are more interested in. I mean, what are the, the drivers? The standard drivers of ecosystem respiration is soil temperature uh, with an exponential dependence, while of the gross primary productivity is uh, the solar radiation with the kelis menten type of function. But then we have identified with, with an empirical procedure the fact that uh, you can have uh, uh, other two drivers which are very important. One is the volumetric water content, so soil moisture, and the other is the day of the year, because it's the, the physiological state of the vegetation. Uh, here, the vegetation grows very rapidly at the, uh, as soon as there is no melt, and then it slowly decays in the course of time. Next slide. So this is a comparison between uh, um, either in sample or leave one out with, with both, with the, with the model and the uh, model and, the, and measured the, data and so you can see I mean one can do better but still it has a high explained variance and so it seems to be an interesting um, empirical model for these these plots for all the plots it's not obvious whether it can be extended to other similar areas in the Alps that is something that we are trying to um, to, to understand next slide in the case of uh, the uh, Bayelva of the Svalbard uh, there is another driver which is important. Instead of the day of the year, we could identify the green fractional cover, distinguishing vascular from non-vascular vegetation. And then the, the green fractional cover is a measure there of also of the, of the state of the vegetation. We're trying to do the same, not with the green fractional cover, but the, kind, the biomass in a certain number of vegetation classes in the Alps. Clearly here, there is also uh, the leaf area index, which is important, but, but the vegetation is very low and it's very rare that there are layers of vegetation at, at these altitudes on, on latitudes. Next slide. So what we want to do uh, in the future, certainly uh, open to, to collaboration and to ideas. And we had uh, for two years uh, a summer school on uh, uh, critical zone dynamics, uh, which was co-organized by Tim White and by myself with a lot of some of the uh, various people who, who, who were, uh, were present here who came, and then it would be nice to do it again uh, as soon as we are out of this damned pandemic. Uh, because we had to stop for, for two years, but as soon as it would be possible, we want to start again. So what we want to do, and then it would be great to do with anybody who is interested to come here and to do either here or in the Arctic and to do uh, measurements, is to do a better inclusion of vegetation, phenology and state, comparing in between the, result, the results of the chambers, the flux chambers and the eddy covariance. We are using the estimates of the drivers from remote sensing to see whether we can use those instead of the measurements. Uh, we are looking at the variability at the micro scale inside the plots and the differences between the plots, in particular between the, the plots uh, above different uh, rocks. And then look at winter dynamics. We are looking at this, especially in the Arctic. 
and then uh, using the models to estimate the field of carbon fluxes and develop simple process-based models and look at the permafrost. And so I think that my time is, is uh, finished and I want to thank everybody for inviting me and, and, and all us uh, here. Thank you so much, Antonello. That was wonderful. And it is a beautiful place. So if you have the opportunity to go to that summer school, it is amazing. I have gotten the opportunity to teach there. Um, so last but not least is Fan Zhang, uh, professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Feel free to share your screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Hello? Yeah, okay. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank you all for the invitation and uh, preparation. And I am very glad to have this chance to present something related to segment transport under the climate change over the Tibetan plateau. Uh, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce the background on the river resentment flux changes. Uh, actually, according to uh, the study focusing on the segment flux changes um, of uh, about 145 major rivers in the world. Uh, since uh, 1950s, um, about half of the um, rivers have shown significant decreasing trends, while the other half shows non-significant changing trends. And uh, uh, the reduction of sediment flux is mainly due to soil and water conservation and sediment control measures, uh, as well as the uh, retention of reservoirs. Well, the increase of sediment flux only shows in 5% of the rivers, and uh, which is reported to be due to surface disturbances such as logging and mining, and sometimes maybe climate change. Because this kind of study mostly focus on the downstream of the large, large rivers where observation data is available, and the downstream is always under intensive influence of human activities. Isolated impact of climate change on rivering sediment flux remains poorly understood. Uh, our recent study uh, based on observation data in, uh, in eight headwater river basins of the Tibetan plateau uh, shows that uh, during 1960 to 2017, the air temperature of this eight um, headwater basins over the Tibetan plateau all show significant increasing trends. And at the same time, precipitation increased in the northern basins, but decreased in the southern basins. Under the influence of air temperature and precipitation changes and others, the runoff and sediment flux of uh, this eight headwater basins, half of them show significant increasing trend, while the other half shows non-significant changing trend. So the changing trend of sediment flux is quite different over the Tibetan plateau compared to large rivers all over the world. Uh, Stepwise multivariable regression analysis indicates that precipitation followed by air temperature are the dominating factors of multi-average runoff depths, which is the runoff distributed over the unit uh, catchment area. It should be uh, it uh, should also be noted that uh, the runoff depths is positively related to the air temperature, and this indicates that the overall enhancement of meltwater supply exceeds the evaporation loss caused by air temperature rise over the Tibetan Plateau. Hydrological simulation based on multi-sphere uh, model indicate that in this river, in the river basins with different glacier area ratio, GAR, uh, it indicate that when the glacier area ratio decreases from about 20% to less than 1%, the contribution of meltwater reduces from about 60% to around 20%. In addition to that, as the glacier air ratio decreases, the dominating runoff changing mechanism switches from warming induced increasing glacier melt runoff to rainfall runoff changes. 
And this is about our understanding on the run of which tree, which drives the, the sediment the transport. The correlation between the sediment flux and temperature precipitation uh, was quite different for this uh, high water basins with different uh, glacial air ratios. If you look at this picture, um, the three high water basins on the left are um, the basins with the largest glacial air ratios. And these basins are kind of dominant, dominated by glacier with segment flux positively correlated with air temperature and the increasing glacier melt leading to the significant increase of segment flux. Well, for the other five headwater basins with smaller glacier area ratios, they are kind of dominated by precipitation uh, with segment flux mainly affected by rainfall erosion and showing very changing trend depending on the precipitation changes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'd like to mention the relationship between the segment uh, yield and uh, the precipitation. Uh, uh, the, the, the plot on the left is uh, the, based on the data over the Tibetan plateau. It shows that segment yield decreases with precipitation in arid and semi-arid area which is inconsistent with the Lambingsham curve. Uh, well, uh, the segment yield increases with precipitation in the humid area with larger precipitation. The part for the larger precipitation uh, with NDVI keeping almost stable is on the country with the traditional Lambingsham curve. Therefore, uh, we propose the two questions uh, to discuss or to, to yeah, or for future collaboration. The first is uh, uh, about the sediment flux changing trend in other critical zones under climate change. Uh, are, this, are they also show increasing trends similar to those over the Tibetan plateau uh, or uh, uh, showing other uh, trend, trends? Uh, another question is, uh, the relationship between sediment yield and precipitation in other critical zones, uh, especially those uh, alpine in alpine region, uh, are they showing the similar pattern, uh, or are they showing the similar pattern to the traditional Lambingshan curve? So this is about all for my introduction, and uh, I will be glad to participate in the discussion. Thank you so much, Fan. If the uh, panelists want to go ahead and um, put themselves back on video for now, um, I think Bhavna is going to maybe ask some of the questions that may have popped up in the Q&A. Uh, and we're going to take our discussion from there. We have about 10 minutes. And please enter more questions if you have them into the Q&A area, and uh, we'll be able to Get, get those at least if not answered today, then to the correct people in the future. So you can get some responses. Yeah, I, I think most of the questions have been answered live. I, I think there was one to Stephen about stable isotopes and how that could help with the type of questions that they're looking at at their site. Um, and then there was another for, for Stephen on um, vegetation and regolith and how the trees might drive regular development and are there places or um, where the regolith is already developed and, and you know, there's a preference for trees. So uh, Stephen, do you, do you wanna expand on, on that last aspect there? I see the vegetation bedrock interactions being a theme that a lot of the panelists have mentioned today. I'm um, sure I can I can say a little bit about it and then turn it over. I don't want to uh, want to let other other panelists have time to answer questions for them as well. But um, yeah, that that site was really fat was really surprising to me that you can cross a very narrow zone. A little we, we were calling them these oases with with a, a little bit of vegetation, maybe ten meters wide, um, on an otherwise pavement, a large bare outcrop of granodiorite and that and that beneath those trees 
as as wide as that that narrow zone was, it went just as deep with what looks geophysically. Um, we don't know geochemically yet, but um, when, we, when you dig in there, you can see lots of weathering, and it looks geophysically like mature regolith. And it's 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 almost a vertical. It's like a trough that goes right down. And to me, that really and it goes down much deeper than loblolly pine roots are supposed to go. So that says to me that this is. Um, you know, it's organic acids that are, there's a, there's a hydrological, a water driven um, set of processes that are going on there. This is all um, very new. We're trying to understand why these things are developing where they are. And I think there's some really subtle, interesting topographic things that are happening where dikes and fractures are intersecting at the surface of the outcrop that are probably guiding water. It's, uh, but this, this data is just a few weeks old. So we're, we're in the early days of trying to understand it. I, I think that's very fascinating, especially when I, you know, when I'm thinking about transferable approaches. How do you tackle microtopographic features and, you know, the lows like you're talking about? And it's a big deal for a lot of our SFA sites too. And I see Susan's hand up, so maybe you want to add something to that. Thanks, Bob. No, well, I was going to ask a different question. Um, do you? Okay, I'll just go ahead and maybe it's for uh, Steve and Holly. I don't know if panelists are allowed to ask questions, but here we go. Um, you know, particularly Holly and Steve, because yours are focused so much on bedrock and really understanding current controls and um, how they got to be where they are and what this means for hydrology and maybe biogeochemical functions. I guess I, I'm also interested in your thoughts about, you know, as we look forward, um, relative time scales between the formation of these uh, weathered zones and how they might change as of course our vegetation changes and our water levels change, right? Both of those is one connected system. They're both influencing the formation. And if we care about um, how this bedrock functions in terms of what it delivers in terms of the water cycle or other biogeochemistry, do you have any comments on sort of that time scale as these, you know, as these forcing, as these forcing functions are changing, if you will? Go ahead, Holly. Um, well, I guess I can just say our, our project is very much focused on the, on the modern time scale with recognition that the longer time scales ha are what have created the, the scenarios that we're that we are observing. So, you know, projecting into more geologic type time scales is a little bit outside the, the scope of our current project. We're really using that as the foundation to understand the, the current processes. So I'm, I'm not sure that I'm maybe fully captured the question, um, but uh, perhaps Steve's project would be more appropriate for that. Well, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, Susan. I mean, I think you've put your finger on something that's really uh, one of the big challenges in critical zone science is these you know, vastly different timescales on which relevant processes operate. And you're, 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 we're seeing when we do these geophysical surveys, for example, or you drill, you're seeing this integrated product of, of a long history of regolith development through, through many different climate, you know, climates over time. Um, but I do think that one interesting place where these timescales uh, matter to each other is in the, the ecosystem response, right? Which we can see with climate change. And, you know, Russ, I would point to Russell Callahan's, you know, really nice work in the Sierra Nevada looking at ecosystem, um, e ecosystem response to, to drought, as well as the work that's come out of the Berkeley group, you know, with Daniel Rampi and, 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 and Bill Dutrick and others. Um, and what these long time scale products, the regolith structure is, is definitely turning out, it, it looks like it's turning out to have an impact on how forests, for example, in a particular place respond to a decadal drought. So- um, And forest yeah. change will make a difference on the weathering, right? So, I mean, Holly, it's exciting. You have such a strong modeling focus. I mean, that'll probably lay a nice framework for more of a look forward. And I, I mean, on the East River that I mentioned, just seeing changes in water level with different snow years, we see different exports, right? And it's because of that interaction with the bedrock. So. While the you know those those sort of uh, drivers are happening over pretty short time scales, right? Um, anyway, super interesting. Thank you. 
Antonello, you had your hand up, was yeah, it? Well, yeah, <laughs> thanks. I wanted to make a comment on the depth of the soil and the fact that the soil can be much deeper than, than expected. I mean, the high, our altitude, see, of course, the soil is thinner, but uh, we expected it to be much thinner. In fact, we dig for a, a meter and a half, as you were there also at one, one of the time. And then it's it, it, a lot of organic soil, which is pretty deep. And there are areas, we are not there, but there are other areas of 3,000 meters where you have rocks, flat rocks, and then you take away the rocks, there is one, two meters of black organic soil below. And that probably was a noon attack during the last glaciation. And then it was not covered with ice. And so all the organic material fell there. And then it is a very rich in inorganic material. It's not obvious. And then there is another place which we didn't go to, but would be nice, which was not covered with ice in the last, it's high mountains, but was not covered with ice for various reasons in the last glaciation. And so you should find soil from the Imian somehow, because uh, it was not re reworked by the glaciation. So the, the, this, the story of the, the depth of the soil is fascinating, and this the past story of the soil. Antonella, I think that brings up such an important topic. There's a lot of times where things go so much deeper than we expect, and how surface processes can propagate to so much greater depths than maybe we, we think about. And I think Susan brings up a a very good point about what is the speed of which those are changing? Like how important is it to us over the next 50, 100, 150 years? So I think it's those are really important topics that everybody's brought up today. Well, we have about uh, one and a half minutes left. So I'm not sure if there's any other statements that someone would like to raise or if there's any other questions that got populated um, in the meantime. I, I don't think there are other questions that came up, but I was also thinking about the conceptual model slide that you had um, up there. And, uh, you know, a lot of synergies in, in the type of questions that the different teams here are investigating. I also wonder about tools that and models that might be transferable. So Antonello definitely showed, you know, an equation of how GPP and NEE might change and, and you know, um, are there others? I mean, there's a reactive transport modeling focus in Holly's team and um, others that, you know, thoughts on, on what tools and techniques might be transferable and we should be looking at. If I may add a quick statement, I think that uh, one thing we are trying to see is whether using drivers from remote sensing can help. I mean, once you identify the drivers from local measurements, then some of the drivers can be estimated from remote sensing. Is this good enough or not? Apparently, it's worse than local, but it's better than, <laughs> than nothing. And so that is also something that would allow to expand to larger areas. But that's to be proven. I mean, it's not yet proven. Okay. Anyone else? Susan, were you going to say something? No, thanks, Bob. No, I mean, I think your, uh, your, you and your colleagues have done quite a bit of work in the past AGU workshops and so forth about thinking about some of the transferable models and data tools and so forth, right? Um, I don't know if you have a site where those are listed. I think you might. Is that right? Uh, we have the next quasi series that's going to focus on the tools. Okay, and, great. Yeah, so it will come up. So I think we're at time. And thank you again to all of the panelists and, and the attendees for this. This was a fantastic seminar. Please do join us next Tuesday um, for, for the next one on a focus on alpine sites and synergies between those. So thank you once again for joining. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.